Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Withrow, and I'm the head of exhibitions and publications here at the McMichael. Um, thank you for being with us tonight for an artist talk with June Clark, who has graced us with her insight and her um, wisdom before. For those of you who are um, familiar with our programming uh, in on this platform for the last few years, June uh, joined us in 2021 on the occasion of our Denise Tomasos exhibition. So mm -hmm. we're so glad, June, to uh, have you with us again uh, two years later. Um, before we go into the program, may I begin with a land acknowledgement. The McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the original lands of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat people. It's uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail, which historically provided an integral connection for Indigenous people between Ontario's Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. As an institution, the McMichael recognizes the importance of acknowledging the original territories of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and other Indigenous nations. Before I introduce our um, panel uh, in earnest, I'll just say one quick thing, which is the advantage of being with us live is that if you have questions for June or for Sarah, please look for the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can ask them. Those questions will come to me. We've reserved a little bit of time at the end and uh, I'll do my best to ask June and Sarah um, the questions that you send in. So with that, I'm just going to uh, introduce our panelists and hand this over, um, and I'll begin with our honored guest, June Clark. She may be familiar to many of you. Uh, she was born and raised in Harlem, but came to Toronto in 1968. She has earned a national and international reputation for her photo-based image works, installations, and interventions. Uh, as an artist in residence, she spent more than a year in Paris, two years in New York City, which included the Studio Museum in Harlem, and six months at OCADU. She's exhibited widely throughout Canada and internationally and has taught studio and academic visual arts courses at her alma mater, York University, the University of Guelph, and uh, OCADU, among others. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, June, you joined us in 2021 for a talk with Gaetan Verna um, on the occasion of our Denise Tomasos exhibition. And you're joining us tonight, um, partly because um, we have recently acquired a wonderful new work of yours. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Sarah, many of you know our uh, chief curator, Sarah Milroy. She's one of our most respected, um, one of the most respected public voices and champions of Canadian art. She has been our chief curator since 2018. And in those, uh, in the four ish years since then, she has curated or co curated dozens of exhibitions for the McMichael, including six of the seven shows that we have on the road right now, uh, notably uh, Uninvited Canadian Women Artists in the Modern Moment, which is as we speak, uh, being installed at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa uh, to open at the very beginning of March. Um, prior to climbing aboard uh, the SS McMichael, Sarah was the lead art critic of the Globe and Mail from 2001 until 2011, and before that was the editor and publisher of Canadian Art Magazine, and she was appointed a member of the Order of Canada in 2020. Over to you, Sarah. Jen, thank you so much. And if 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 we all seem a little giddy tonight, it's it's because we got the tech resolved about ten seconds before we went live. So we're all like, <laughs> we did it. Anyway, it makes for great energy. Thanks, Jen. Um, June, I can't believe it's been two years since you were talking with us when Denise Tomasos was up. I don't know. I'm still marveling at the spongy elasticity of time um, from through COVID and now beyond. It just seems like it was about four months ago that we did that. But anyway, <laughs> in the intervening time, as Jen said, we've been busy doing many things. But one of the core things that we're trying to do is build our collection and diversify our collection to tell the stories that are relevant to all Canadians. And uh, it was actually, you know, a love affair at the Toronto Art Fair when I came across this in Daniel Furia's booth at the Art Fair. And I didn't know you were making these sculptures. And I just, you know, I, I just uh, fell for it, uh, went down like nine pins and scrambled around to find Daniel and, you know, put our, put our name on it because it's such a powerful statement and we're going to talk about it when we, you know, towards the end of this talk, I'm going to kind of like start here and then take us back and then we're going to move forward, you know, to the Perseverance Suite, which this is one of the prototypes <clears throat> for. But 
you know, it's it's land, it's 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 giving, it's mm-hmm. got its histories of struggle, it's 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 kind of such a remarkably complex and wonderful work, and we are so so thrilled to have it at the McMichael. <laughs> and we are making well, plans to show it very very soon. <laughs> We're having to re- reorganize a whole room to figure out you know how to get this thing, you know. <laughs> working to its best and loudest advantage but um, maybe what I we should do is just go you know back before we go forward and and talk about um you know moving to Canada before I go to the first slide which is going to be some of your early photo work but that's made quite a bit after you moved to Canada in 1968 very charged Mm -hmm. year can you tell us about coming here and and the transition of moving from Harlem to Toronto well, as as I've said to you before personally, that uh, at the time my husband was a draft dodger, and mm-hmm. so we the, the whole story of uh, having forty eight hours to get out of the country was pretty uh, traumatic at the time, and uh, luckily there were uh, very good. Uh, political party in uh, or coming in at the time. And I just felt that we were welcomed with open arms, Mm -hmm. Uh, that you could at that time get landed immigrant status at the border, which was pretty incredible. And uh, yes, and, and so it was a no brainer for us to come up, although, we didn't know about Toronto. I had no idea about Toronto or that Toronto existed. Our coming from New York, our uh, periscope was always yeah. pointed to Montreal. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what we assumed. And he was going to finish his degree. And after that, we had planned to move to Montreal. But if you remember, the early 70s in Montreal were pretty... Uh, <laughs> Volatile. <laughs> Volatile, thank you. And uh, then the kids were born and we just yeah. thought we would stay and we had jobs, etc. So yeah, wonderful. That's what we did. And when I came, I wasn't practicing art at all. I you were raising came. a family. Yes. Well, no, I was, I, I came into administration at yeah. U of T. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, I was given a camera. And mm-hmm. because the wrenching from the country was so abrupt, I found myself walking around trying to find familiar images with my camera that uh, I could at least think about where I, I uh, come from and how I had uh, been abruptly <laughs> removed. Mm-hmm. So, so that uh, really was the, the beginning. And, yeah. uh, and again, as anything, if someone says, oh, I like those, then you keep doing it. You mm-hmm. become mm-hmm. encouraged. And I found Laura Jones at the uh, Baldwin Street Gallery. Yes. And then myself and a group of other women started the Women's Photography Cooperative. And we taught ourselves uh, the whole from gamut of photography because you you probably are aware that women were not allowed in the darkroom at U of T at that time. I did not know in that. The, <laughs> in the early. <laughs> too, far too suggestive an environment. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So you had to have your own. You had to have a dark room of your own. Yeah. So, so Laura and John had two dark rooms in the basement of the Baldwin Street Gallery. Mm-hmm. And that's where we worked. Uh, and were you and there like, the, you know, every day? Were you there? I, I was there pretty much. I mean, I, I, my kids were, were small and yeah. they grew up in the dark room going <laughs> with me to the dark room. 
Yeah. And uh, just teaching ourselves how to yeah. do it. We we learned the Ansel Adams zone system and mm -hmm. uh, how to develop and uh, how to frame in our brains mm -hmm. through the camera. The subject. So yeah. these, these yeah. Um, pictures that you took early in your career, they're about to be shown, aren't they? A, a, an excerpt of these this year. And I forgot to ask you about that yes. the other day. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell us about is, that? It, they're mounting an exhibition of uh, some early photographs, all from Toronto, that uh, will be shown during contact at the gallery. At Daniel Furrier so, Gallery. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. And they are in the process as we speak, choosing these images and and uh, having them framed. And, and what so they will be. Yeah, like in the process of looking at those images again, as you're no doubt doing, what what do you what surprised you about the woman who was taking these pictures? Like, did you what was it to meet your your former self in these photos? Yeah, I remember you. her and 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 the camera holding the camera using the camera there was there was a calmness about mm -hmm. me it calmed me down I was able to figure out who I was where I was going and I just felt quite powerful with the camera mm -hmm. I had no problem, as you know, I, I did many, many portraits. I had no problem of asking people, could I photograph them? And I just found that people felt calm with me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there you was a synergy that. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, you can, you can really see that. Thing. This is a particularly fabulous picture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One that you go back to later on. <laughs> that was before. That was before it was legal. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he doesn't care if it's legal or not. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> He's just really enjoying looking at you. That's all I see there. <laughs> it's a great, great picture. So you're also looking at, you know, um, Black culture in Toronto at that time. And and what was it yes. like in Toronto at that time to be a member of the Black community? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I, I felt myself as being a member. Um, I, I found them and sought them out. And mm -hmm. uh, at first it, it wasn't, it was just, I just knew they were there. And then I, I met so many wonderful, wonderful, people as you know the third world bookstore was there mm -hmm. the uh, all of these shops were there and I, I met the merchants and the barber shops and the salons and uh and I and where, again, where was I yeah. go out every day where was the music scene um, principally centered at the we're talking about the 70s here pretty much I'm not I I I can't say I I knew that as much as mm -hmm. the merchants and the shops because yeah. I had two young children so uh, the music scene was out, out of you know better because where to go they, get a four year old's haircut yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. so uh, very on on occasion I would be able to go out but. The yeah. 70s. I didn't do movies. I didn't do music. I did <laughs> just a bit of a blur. And of course, you know, you know, babies on the hip and yeah. the camera on the hip. Yeah. Well, so, you did well. Yeah. My God, you kept yourself, you know, breathing above <laughs> water. It's not easily done. Well, exactly. Yeah. It was very important to do that. I mean, they're yeah, fabulous yeah. pictures. I can't wait to see this show. It's going to be a, yeah. a revelation, I think, probably for you as much as for the rest of us, because you haven't it, it is a to it is. be with uh, this work. Madeline at the gallery is uh, really the one choosing the the imagery. And and I'm just amazed to, to revisit these images again and uh, remember what that decade was like, because this is... We're talking 15 years mm -hmm. of the camera before mm -hmm. I 
decided to go to York, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here's a piece from a little bit and later. This in was life. a piece I made, I made when I went to York. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a, a guy I, I found, uh, I didn't find, he found me. He was sitting outside the Barton uh, retirement home and uh, he sat up and asked and saw for the camera and asked me to photograph him. And uh, I did thinking, not thinking of it, just obliging him, mm -hmm. but I've used his image in so many ways now. And this is was called the Shrine for the Men when I learned how to do printmaking and yes. being able to do photo etching. And this piece is of glass and uh, wood. And uh, uh, the photo etchings and it was Shrine for the Men. It was it was partly, you know, Rodney King and all of the things that were happening and are still happening yeah. to uh, Black men. And I suppose it for me, it was having a son and realizing that, you know, I think Black women feel they have a son and they, they give birth to a target. And so that yeah. was my way of trying to uh, come to terms with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Through this figure. Okay. And what is in the case yeah. with, the, with the photography? Well, I, I uh, used handmade paper mm -hmm. and a cowrie, a cowrie shell bracelet and bones and mirrors. It, it's really intuitive of mm -hmm. things that... I, that's the way I work with material. Material mm -hmm. tells me what it wants to do and be. And mm -hmm. uh, it's almost, it, I really do. I mean, it sounds ridiculous because people yeah. think that's crazy, but really I no. go into a kind of a, a meditation and the material mm -hmm. says, and sometimes it resists and will say, no, I do not belong here. <laughs> and I have to change it. But I, that, that's how I found I work. Yeah. When I, I have elements that I want to put together. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a super powerful piece. Mm -hmm. I had never seen it before. And I just went researching for tonight. I came across it and thought, mm, let's to talk about this one. Yeah. Sounds like it has a special place in your life. That moment of uh, yes, goodbye to yes. you know, sending your son out in the world, and this is a family photo mm -hmm. I understand of yes, various and many strong is, people. I just made this piece. I made this piece. That's my great grandmother sitting in the middle, and I mean, you can Lady. see I'm about nine, and I, I was ex <laughs> extremely lucky to know her. And and here, I mean, that's she used to say that the the text that's under yeah. and and I made this piece. Mm -hmm. uh, Very wise woman. Because I found I love using text with uh, photographs. This is a photo etching actually mm -hmm. that I took from from a, a tiny brownie photograph. And, and those are the, my grandparents and my uncles and aunts. And we were at a, a family barbecue in uh, Long Island at, at my uh, aunt's house mm -hmm. in, as, uh, as being your aunt in here. Long Island, New York. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I just yeah. think, you know, it's such a wonderful image because you obviously are so confident and so at ease with these people. You know? <laughs> yes. I, yeah, well, I say my mother, my mother was making the photograph and yeah. I think because she was trying to make sure everyone was in it and everyone smiled, I suspect that had she noticed my hand trying to be cute under my chin, she would have told me to, <laughs> to move it, but I know that I did it at the last minute. <laughs> you got her. 
<laughs> but it actually, you know, it reveals a lot about your personality. So this, this so this was um, this was a, a silk screened onto handmade paper, or what is this object we're looking at? Is it a? It's a photo etching where you okay. commit the image to a copper plate and yes. then okay. uh, ink it and put it through the press. Wonderful. And, so and under it, you, you can add the text to it. Okay. Yeah. And then this image um, ends up, this image of you from this picture ends yes. up here I in the series. Formative triptychus. I use old yeah. photographs quite a lot. And uh, so, and this is the, the triptych that I did, the formative triptych that... Uh, lessons learned throughout mm -hmm. life and things mm -hmm. that propel me forward because I remember, remember them. Yeah. And the and first image is prob I'm, I'm probably seven there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm probably seven. And that's my sister, my older sister standing behind me. Oh yeah. And, uh, I should have sent you, the, I have the whole image and I use that image of myself in other other uh, ways as well. Um, I find I use it a lot. You know, it's a very mm -hmm. peaceful, I mean, it's, it's very interesting the relationship between the image and, and text in your works because it's an incredibly peaceful, calm, I mean, the, the, those are slightly apprehensive eyes, but you know, you look very, um, self-assured and confident to me i and there's I this think very difficult so. uh, you know someone said that uh going through therapy try and think of when you felt really strong and i think seven to yeah. nine maybe seven to ten i felt really good inside and then of course the tween ages came oh. <laughs> that was very different but mm -hmm. yeah i felt assured and i i, I remember be feeling really uh comfortable with myself during those years of it's course you know we great. always think and yeah that's the 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 middle part of the triptych and uh, I I haven't used that image much. I, that's I think the only time I ever used that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mm -hmm. rather like it. And you met, it's fantastic. And you uh, <laughs> mentioned the red broom and dustpan set. Did you feel? Yeah. As a girl, like you and I have never really talked about what kind of expectations were put on you. But if you're receiving a dustpan and broom as a gift. That's exactly <laughs> what that text means. You yeah. know, wondering about the expectations mm -hmm. of, of uh, presence that you give to young girls. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very different. And again, the Easter Bunny. I really, I still remember that thinking that the Easter Bunny should have been solid. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> and this woman. And this, I've, as an adult, I've, I've learned that that actually didn't happen to her, or mm -hmm. I've been told that it didn't. But at the time, that's what I taught. That's what I was taught. And so that comes with, it's an ironic statement because we know, I always said, if Obama found himself on the wrong street alone yeah. at night, he'd be as vulnerable as anyone. And so it's just ironic when you think that if you get to a certain point, you're safe and you're not safe. You're mm -hmm. never safe. You know, because no one knows who you are or, or whether they should care about you or not if you're in trouble. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're seeing that happen over and yeah. over and over again. Right. So well, uh, it's a really powerful work, those three images together. So here's our friend, our mm -hmm. pot smoking friend again. 
but he's yes. morphed <laughs> into a later work. And here you're moving. Yes. Of course, you're using your your historic photography again. again. Yeah. Yes, but, again. And I and I realized once I learned the art of printmaking, and I could then manipulate because when I was doing photography, it was frowned on that you would manipulate photographs or, you mm -hmm. know, they should be straight and if they should be documents and, and whatnot. And I guess it was Steinberg who freed me and I felt I could do anything with my photographs. And then I realized that the photographs and the texts are about 25 years apart mm -hmm. because the, the, the words rose to the surface when I began looking at the old photographs and I, I would get a text and then I'd rumble through and try and, and find an image that would go with mm -hmm. the text that was rising to the surface in my memory. That's so and, interesting uh, because, you know, so, I think I think that that some people might think it's curious that as a person who makes images and who, who enjoys photography, that you wouldn't be perpetually making new images as opposed to going back to things you've taken before. But I think what that speaks to me of is the way in which we all like, carry certain images that are just sort of indelible that we our minds do go back to again and again there's certain things that stick Constantly. like birds and some of them we don't want to remember mm -hmm. but, you know um or even yeah. memories, but just a flash that you that just sticks there in the soft that's exactly side. right it's that not going remember. anywhere yeah yeah i um i as i say it was 15 years of doing straight photography and i became i'm going to ask you to a tiny business of doing portraits of people and I just got tired of people coming back to me saying could you take this mold off or could you take this or could you smooth this out and everything so so, I, so I'm just going to stop you because we're yeah. getting a strange audio quality again oh. and I'm wondering if you I know we're having that really are having a tech problem Jen um are you hearing that as well or is it my computer Yes, I am hearing it as well. It as well. Okay. Um, oh, earlier, it's gone now. Oh, it's gone. Oh, okay. It's, it's just temporary. Out. I'm. I, it's windy out. That's all I can. <laughs> <say>. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, here we go. Let's keep moving on. So here's this okay. wonderful little picture again, again in again, Whispering again, City. I used her yet again. Um, yes. And, and you that and, people mistook kindness for weakness. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that was a saying that I guess someone said to me or yeah. my dad or my grandmother or something like that. And you just didn't and, forget it. Right, yeah. exactly. And is and, this phrase something that someone said to you? Yes, as a kid, as Ooh. a kid, when I was playing outside, this happened. But this image was done on Bathurst Street. Mm -hmm. But again, I you know, these things stay with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, and it's true that actually happened to me. <laughs> God, when you were still living in Harlem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. little yeah. kid. Yeah. It's extraordinary. But when, as again, I, I was just doing a, a, a talk with, about the Harlem quilt. When I was growing up, the, on my street, it was like a United Nations. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily all Black people. Right. And now it's gone that way again because uh, they've gentrified so much of Harlem. Yeah. But uh, at the time, there were all people, but we were all on the same level, I think, yeah, economically yeah. in that, you know. Right. And so, so you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this piece was was a piece was that developed while in New York, returning. That to was Museum. at the Studio Museum, and it was part of my final exhibition as a resident there. And I found that when I went back to uh, 
the studio museum and, and accepted the the residency it was very traumatic my mother was there my sister was there and i i went around for a few days just in a days uh we feeling that everything had changed in harlem mm -hmm. and absolutely nothing had changed it was when clinton decided he was going to make a big show about having a, a an office on 125th street so i was trying to come to terms with how it felt to be back in the heart of where i grew up and yeah. So what I my my what I did was I uh, instead of trying to editorialize and and choose the images in Harlem, I walked. I would set the camera at a certain uh, f stop and distance in in, in the morning, and I would use the camera at my hip. Mm -hmm and walk around and snap photographs. So I often did not know what I had until mm -hmm. they were developed. Mm -hmm. And that was necessary for me because I wanted to discover what Harlem was at the same time. Yeah, and since then I realized that uh, I also was holding the camera at, this, at the height of a kid. The kid. I was just going to say, how interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, most of my, uh, my work is about memory. And so that the Harlem quilt is, is me trying to discover what was there, but also seeing it from, from the eyes of a little kid. Mm -hmm. And this, this and project even yeah. Even when I uh, had had the camera at at eye level, I would hold it up. So I what I never looked through the lens, not once, mm -hmm. in making this piece. So is it Walker Evans that does the subway pictures that way, famously? Yes. The photography. Well, yeah. he 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 put his in a box and he. He hid it. I didn't hide the camera. <laughs> I would just walk around and click. Yeah, yeah. The camera was there. I wasn't trying to hide that I was making yeah. photographs. I was just trying not to, to be totally in uh, control of it. I think he liked yeah. the idea of not knowing what he was going to get too. So it, exactly something that about was that. That extremely but... exciting. Very very exciting. So and this so... is is collecting graffiti. I, I collected graffiti for about two years. I don't know how many I have, but uh, I, I would carry a little notebook around. Mm -hmm. And when I found graffiti, I would uh, write it down because they're all anonymous and uh, they, but they needed to say something. They needed to say what they were feeling at that moment. And uh, so these are all anonymous uh, graffiti. I think this needs, I think this needs to be a, I think this needs to be an artist multiple t-shirt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great expression. <laughs> <laughs> and that was found in a washroom at, in a restaurant. And uh, in Toronto, complete, yeah. in Toronto, mm -hmm. Peter Pan, the Peter Pan, uh, you yeah. reminded me yeah. that, and yeah. complete with the little heart drawn. So I had to do it just the way, <laughs> and on an angle. I mean, I suspect someone was sitting on the toilet as yeah. I was <laughs> doing. <laughs> well, it's the heart adds a je ne sais quoi definitely to this. It's a <laughs> Exactly. But where did this and this this was from? in Paris. In Paris. I, this was graffiti in Paris. Um, and uh, again, someone who needed to say this and and uh, mm -hmm. do it, you know. So too many Caucasians in Morocco, I'm sure, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> That's right. From their point of view. And this is very touching, this one. This, this one was, uh, I was going to Montreal and I was on the train and we were pulling out of Toronto and this was on a box, at, you know, because you go slowly as yeah. the train comes out and this was on a box uh, in the uh, train yard yeah. by yeah. Union Station. I remember, it's funny, once yeah. I, I write it down, I remember. Uh, exactly where it was that you saw it, yeah. Exactly. Well, it's very haunting, yeah, yeah, yeah. particularly when you tell me that story, mm -hmm. it was in such a lonely place. Mm-hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm yeah yeah and uh and this you know i i i deliberately put it on a wrinkled piece of uh canvas these are all on newsprint on canvas and i just i and sometimes i would iron them out but because yeah. of the sentiment i thought the the wrinkled canvas went with the expression don't panic you know what's interesting is this this way of you know cutting letters out and putting them together is is something that's usually used in hostage notes where that's exactly right their their handwriting yes yes my friend carolyn calls them ransom notes but there <laughs> i do it because of of the graffiti writer being anonymous yeah. And so that's why I, I use the newsprint in that yeah. way, because we don't know who they are. And uh, they just, for the moment, they need to write something. Mm -hmm. And uh, totally to intriguing. say something. Unfortunately, I, I'm finding that I don't find these anymore. It's almost as if, it's gone out of style. They have spray paint, but I yeah. think but not writing. writers, they, they're not philosophers anymore. They all want to be Basquiat, I think. And well, so I think we better be. I think we have to inspire the next generation. <laughs> yeah, I, I really mean, they were space. philosophers. Yeah, yeah. No, and yeah, exactly. No. But now it's just tagging or or yeah. trying to be discovered as yeah. opposed to needing to tell the world how they were feeling that day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's very different yeah. yeah 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 so so around 2003 and, i think this is the second work like this that you made in this series that that went mm -hmm. on um to become so important to you but um I, i've heard you in an interview talk about you know i'm thinking about that simon and girl garfunkel song you know all gone to search for america look for america driving on the interstate highway um mm -hmm. you've talked about stopping on the highway and picking up not a good idea by the way please don't do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> but picking up rusted mufflers and mufflers them and then making elements out of them how did this first one dirge come into being uh, it was it 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 came after the I don't know if you remember in the early what is it when gas was at a premium mm -hmm. and people were driving around with gas uh, containers filled with gas because they didn't want to and I was just thinking the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And these mufflers, and I just thought that's what was happening to the United States, that they were just going to rust. And so it was important for me to make uh, a flag out of the detritus on the highway. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kept up, I had to keep up with my tetanus shots because I Cut yeah. myself so many times cutting, yeah. cutting these uh, stars out. Each star is cut by me and, mm -hmm. and the piece. whole yeah. 
flag is is uh, hand cut with snips that I got. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's it, interesting it you know, because just I associate mufflers so much with noise too, with really really noisy cars. Mm -hmm. I think it's like. Um, mm -hmm. Jen and I were just in Montreal a couple of, I guess, last week, and we saw the final days of the Basquiat exhibition that was there. And the show was exploring, you know, what they called sort of sonic thinking, or how do you embed sonic reactions into static works of art that are silent? You know, mm -hmm. and I think this is like a strangely noisy painting or object in a yes. way. It carries the, mm -hmm. the um, anticipation of sound in it somehow. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I, uh, yeah, it's I agree <laughs> with you. And this piece, yeah. is this piece also now in the collection of the AGO? I'm trying to remember. Yes, yeah, it is. Wonderful. Good. Yes, it is. And so it's this was, full... yeah. So this was a Go show ahead. that just like, I think it blew a lot of people's minds in, you know, during COVID it opened and you could come and, and see these wonderful things. Um, which is more than 20 years of work, right? That were the span of making these flags. Oh, yes. Well, I found that it, I was actually surprised when I looked around the studio and saw how many flags in mm. different iterations that mm. I had made. And uh, it is, mm -hmm. when you grow up in the United States, every morning you know you have to say the Pledge of Allegiance with your hand over your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've yeah. told this story so many times, the flag is was sacred. And uh, I mean, now it's on everything, but at the time you couldn't uh, do anything but revere the flag. Mm -hmm. And I remember in grade school, there was always a flag monitor mm -hmm. and the flag monitor would take the flag out, put it up, we'd say a Pledge of Allegiance. At the end of the day, the flag would come down and be folded. And I remember I must have been in grade two or three and the flag monitor accidentally put the flag on the floor and there was a collective. <gasps> Yeah. like this and i mean talk about brainwashing <laughs> <laughs> and that little piece that little piece over on the left hand side here is a folded flag is it not yes that and this piece part of an uh, yeah, yeah. No, and then this piece, piece here is, is is this one so there is this that's called my precious my precious so it is you I'm know sorry. this sense of something that's really cherished but then, yes. you know, then you get busy with doing things, you know, to the flag. And I think, you know, this is a very moving piece to me because it's really about dismantling your idealization of something. And I think it's mm -hmm. important that the piece well, is ripped up. It's actually... Well, this it actually wasn't ripped. It wasn't ripped. Yeah. This was the... I would say, yeah, no, this was the piece that I made at the Studio Museum. And I was, again, trying to figure out where I fit in, what Harlem meant, what the, the states meant and everything. And so I slowly took it apart uh, and cut the, uh, the uh, stars out of the black field but mm -hmm. i i it's not ripped it's it's no it's just taking it apart to try and figure it out you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. like a kid that tries to take thing take a machine apart to figure out how it works and so i i i over the years i've been trying to come to terms with this symbol that I feel betrayed me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a close up of it. You can see how, you know, like really the devotion in your, the handiwork of this though, of the way everything is hemmed and finished. It's again, very precious yeah. in, in trying to 
you know, f- figure it out. Yeah. Investigate, and, uh, investigate, you know, in a way. yeah, yeah. So this is a different approach, moral disengagement, mm-hmm. and uh, also painstaking labor, but of a different, of a different sort. And I'll just show people yes. a detail of it yes. so you can get a sense of what you've done here. Yeah, and that this is just simply pulling threads, mm. just just pulling the threads out to just see again what would happen and how it would react. And I walked in to the studio one day and it it was on the wall and I would take it down. And when I was uh, trying to figure something out or I would just absentmindedly pull the threads. And I walked in one day and the flag said to me, I'm finished. Yeah. You've done it. You don't have to do anything else. And that's what I did. This is the one the National Gallery acquired as well. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And it's um mm. three years work to make this off and on. Yeah. You know, doing other things as well. But it that that devotional investment of time again is really something you really feel. Yes. In the work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful piece. So then we come to what you're busy with these days and lift every voice yes. was, was a kind of a breakthrough piece, I think, um, for you. I, think, this is, I understand yes. this is mounted on the wall, you were saying earlier. Yes, um, it, just, it hangs on the wall. And, so how did this, uh, how did this it, come to be? You know, <laughs> I looked at, it was, I collect a lot of things. I mean, you can imagine. And uh, I looked at it and looked at the fork and whatnot and and just thought maybe I would weave them together. Mm. And so that's what I did. I wasn't, I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, it, again, materials speak to me mm. and I have to obey and and it said and they say I want to do this or I don't want to do that and I try things out and and I needed to weave this shovel with the fork Mm -hmm. and what I'm what's happening with me is that I uh, am marrying domestic Mm-hmm. tools with field tools field work. Mm-hmm. and 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 that and I guess for me it's feminine and masculine and and the fact that all of these tools I grew up with people using these tools mm-hmm. and so these are sort of homage to the people who allowed me to be sitting here Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. and how they work. And with all of these pieces, as I say, I'm marrying domestic and the field because the, they work together. They had to work together. Husband and wife had to work together. And that's what I grew up with in order to survive. Mm-hmm. You know, this whole big thing about now they're two salaried families and stuff. I don't, I didn't know anything else but that and yeah. growing up. So, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, yeah, so there they are. They, they have to be equal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you feel that here. So this is the, yeah. This, yes. The first, the, perseverance suite and this is one of the first earliest works that you made in this in this new series that you're working on it's this it's the second piece i made yeah Mm -hmm. the first one was lift every voice and then it was this Mm -hmm. one again having those i don't want to disguise the tools but i also want to render them unusable Yes. And uh, so yes. that I, I this this hugging 
of the bowl and protection of the bowl. Uh, there are three people in my family, four people in my family, I think of as I make these things, you know, the ice tongs are my grandfather, the fork is my other grandfather, you know, the, the shovel of my, <clears throat> my uncle, the bowl is my grandmother, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it, it has brick dust. I use a lot of brick dust because brick dust was seen as good luck and it protected oh. you. And you would put it on your stoop and you would put it on your front door. Uh, and it was just a symbol of, of uh, home to mm -hmm. me. And security. Mm -hmm. But that was mm -hmm. a exactly brick dust in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it was a superstition, but still it was important. And so I use it, I use it quite a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. I was breaking up brick dust yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's something, it's a sort of sacramental um you know, material that is quite accessible in an urban environment too. It's like you can make something out of exactly. that exactly easily for yourself. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think so one, one of the things I, I, so um, you know, intriguing about this object is is the kind of balance between um, kind of menace really in the sharpness of those tools and but also with, with mm -hmm. comfort and safety, you know? So it's like, it's like both those things at the same time. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly, those are the sentiments and the emotions I felt going into it and, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how I would render these tools mm -hmm. to- so where, where are you finding- honor. Where are we finding these tools? Oh, everywhere everywhere <laughs> and some of them I've had for a very long time but um I I pick up a lot of stuff and I love rust so I find <laughs> rusty things all over the place <laughs> well now I have a key to my eye up too <laughs> Well, look, yeah. Jan, I, I'm wondering, um, we have a few more minutes here, and Jen, I'm wondering if there are some questions or if you have some thoughts for June. It's just been fascinating to talk to you. This has been such a wonderful conversation to listen in on. Um, we have not had any questions. We have only had, in the Q&A, we've had expressions of appreciation for the conversation that's going on, but no one has asked a question. I'm curious, you just said you love rust, but can you say a bit more about that? Yeah. Oh, just the color and the warmth of it. And also the memory of it, mm -hmm. the memory of who used it and who needed it and uh, why they needed it and why did they throw it away? And I, I feel I rescue, rescue the, the labor that w had gone into to using the tool mm -hmm. and or making uh, the tool I, even you know because i mean rusted objects well exactly i have i'm using a lot of homemade tools as mm -hmm. well in the the, the subsequent pieces mm -hmm. that uh, you'll see when you come sarah <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it so, but i mean the thing is that rusting yeah. objects are kind of returning back to the elements too they're going back to soil basically you know, exactly. Very slow. Exactly. Yes. But you know, they're they're mm -hmm. they're basically time and oxygen and H two O and stuff are just like dissolving the metal mm -hmm. and taking it back to to an element that is you know common to all of us. So it's it's mm -hmm. a powerful symbol. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and especially and uh, as I say, I find I find it quite warm, and mm -hmm. uh, and and it it embodies 
so much of life mm -hmm. that uh, it's good. Now, June, uh, I good. forgot to ask you this earlier, but are you still teaching or have you decided to? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. no. Once, once I got the Paris studio, I quit all teaching jobs okay. and just went to Paris. Yeah. yeah but you yeah. must have a lot of uh, <laughs> younger people in your life that are in touch with you that you've impacted over all your years of teaching because you were like, I do. Mm hmm. Yeah, I do. I do. I have it. It was teaching was very good for me. I I really it it exhausted me, but I loved it. I really really it's the administration that we have a problem <laughs> with. The students are all fabulous. Students are great. Yeah. Well, they would would have been so lucky to have you, and so have we. We're so. You know, there's that wonderful saying that when Vietnam shook the apple tree, all the good apples fell on. <laughs> this side of the fence and i think you I haven't heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> we got all the good ones you know ones that didn't want to go fight in vietnam but um anyway you're certainly one of those fabulous ones that fell oh. on our side of the fence and thank goodness you did and I, and I thank you so much for for having the conversation with me it's fun to to go through and think about my ideas and and uh clear things in my head yeah. in your head yeah well you're <laughs> obviously on an incredible new journey with these sculptures and you know i i will we will be all watching very very carefully as this uh, unfolds it's going to be fascinating oh, wonderful okay and i know I, I know i would be remiss jennifer if i didn't bring us to this last uh arguably slightly deflating uh slide which is please well, help us <laughs> i'll say two i'll say three things before we close off the first is my genuine thanks to you june for joining us um it's been so fascinating to hear you reflect on your work throughout the decades and what you're thinking about for the future so thanks for spending your evening with us um thank Sarah, you thank for you. having me <laughs> Sarah. thank you as always for guiding us in these um conversations that are so accessible um to people okay. who either are already huge fans of june clark's work or or who are just learning about um, her legendary contribution to the Art of Canada. Um, I will say this conversation was recorded, so you will find it uh, on our YouTube uh, page in the coming days. So if you are watching and th are thinking, I know someone who would have really loved to be here tonight, you can find it on our YouTube channel and uh, forward it along. Um, and since we're on this slide with this uh, QR code, I will say that we uh, really enjoyed making these um, artist talks free for audiences across Canada and across the world. Um, but we can only do this kind of thing with the help of people who, like us, believe that Canadian art deserves the world class treatment. So if you are moved to support us, you can do it with one click of this uh, QR code. You can go to the mcmichael.com slash donate. You can join as a member. Uh, members get advance notice of all the good things that we uh, put on. And um, or you can visit us. Another great way to support us is to visit us. We are open um Tuesday to Sunday and tickets are available in advance online or in the moment at the front desk so please come and see us and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the McMichael or on zoom for our next gathering thanks for being with us thank you June thank you Sarah so good night thank, thank you, you very very much good night <laughs>